If you were born in the 21st century, then there's a good chance that Y2K doesn't mean anything to you. But it was a big deal. The president of the United States at that time, Bill Clinton, referred to it as the first challenge of the 21st century successfully met. It was the year 2000 problem, the millennium bug, a $308 billion mistake caused by short-sightedness. See, computer programs at that time shortened four-digit years to the last two digits. For example, 1995, the year I was born, would have been referred to by computers of the time as 95, and this wasn't a problem in the 20th century, the century when computers went from this to this. But as these programs started approaching 99, people realized that there wasn't anything after that. At the turn of the century, computer clocks would be reset to zero, zero. And this was a big problem because many countries, especially the United States, which was the center of the digital world back then, were heavily reliant upon computers at this point. Industries like transportation, energy, and banking needed their digital clocks to be accurate. And so as the turn of the millennium approached, people started to panic. They thought that the world was on the brink of a computer-induced apocalypse. They stocked up on food, water, and weapons, and withdrew large sums of money in anticipation of the Y2K collapse. The clock struck midnight. The new century began. And the world, well, it stayed the same. There was no apocalypse, no collapse. And whether the world knew it or not, they had an Indian city by the name of Bangalore to thank for that. Now, today we know Bangalore as Bengaluru, the capital city of Karnataka and the center of India's startup ecosystem. But on January 1st of the year 2000, the world knew this city as Bangalore, the city that still understood COBOL. Let me explain. Those industries that I mentioned earlier, transportation, energy, and banking, well, many of their operations were controlled by giant mainframe computers. These machines would occupy entire rooms. They were massive, and they were old. I'm talking 1950s old. But the prevailing mentality across these industries at the time was, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Most of these mainframe computers were still in perfect working condition 50 years after they were installed. Things were built to last back then. And so even though they ran on a programming language called COBOL, which by the late 90s had fallen out of common use in the United States, these legacy machines were still powering a large majority of America's industries. And while they weren't broke yet, they were gonna be. Now, I should note here that COBOL hadn't been completely forgotten in the United States. There were still some programmers who actually understood this antiquated language, but some wasn't gonna cut it here. Estimates put the number of lines of code required to avoid the Y2K crisis at 180 billion. It was gonna take 1.1 million programmers, and that is where Bengaluru comes in. COBOL was still actively being taught in Indian colleges. There were tens of thousands of Indian engineers who were proficient in this language. And while American COBOL programmers were expensive, Indian ones were cheap. Suddenly, the United States and the world was in desperate need of these engineers. And so over the course of the 90s, and especially near the end of the decade as the new millennium loomed on the horizon, entire companies started popping up in and around Bengaluru to offer Y2K bug solutions. From $100 million in 1990, India's IT sector grew 80x by 2001, becoming an $8.26 billion industry. But all of this growth wasn't just a result of the Y2K. Y2K crisis. There was another crisis that India would benefit from just around the corner. In March of 2000, America's dot-com bubble burst. In the subsequent months, many prominent US-based internet companies would go bankrupt as venture capital dried up and their business disintegrated because of unsustainable burn rates. The survivors of this crash had a harder time raising funds, and many of them came up with strategies to reduce spending on salaries and also to diversify their customer bases. And one of these strategies was international expansion. Yahoo was one of the trailblazers here. They set up offices in Mumbai and Bengaluru in 2000 and 2002, respectively. Their biggest competitor, Google, set up their office in Bengaluru the following year, in 2003. Then, in June of 2004, eBay acquired India's biggest online marketplace, Bazi.com, for $50 million. And a week later, Amazon followed their lead by setting up an office in Bengaluru six years after they made their unofficial entry into India in 1998, when 
they acquired Jungly, an Indian online shopping service that allowed customers to search for products and compare their prices. They bought Jungly for $250 million as a way of starting to build their customer base in India. At the same time, Jungly enabled Amazon to avoid India's strict regulations on foreign retailers operating within the country. It wasn't until 2013 that Amazon would officially launch its India marketplace, Amazon.in, leaving plenty of time for homegrown alternatives to pop up. The first of these was Fabmart.com, a Bengaluru-based e-commerce company that was founded in 1999 in HAL's second stage, Indranagar, just opposite of where Aether's main experience center is located today. And Fabmart would go through a couple of evolutions over the years, from Fabmart to Fab Mall and then India Plaza. But there's a good chance that you haven't heard of any of these, and that's because they don't exist anymore. Fabmart was just too early to succeed. In 1999, public internet in India was a new thing. It had only been launched a few years earlier in 1995. At that time, speeds were slow thanks to narrowband connections, and the cost of each kilobit made surfing the web a luxury that few could justify paying for. It was only in 2003 when the I2I undersea cable network was established by India's Bharti Group and Singapore Singtel that faster speeds became possible. And following this, the government of India's 2004 broadband policy established a 256 kilobit per second internet as the minimum speed. This increase in internet speed coincided with another increase that India saw between the financial year of 2003 and the financial year of 2007, real GDP growth averaging close to 9% per year. India's economy was growing, and along with it, the spending power of middle-class Indians was growing too. In this time period, the number of Indian households with more than $10,000 in disposable income roughly doubled, from little over 10 million to upwards of 20 million. This financial prosperity, paired with India's increasing internet connectivity, gave rise to one of the most crucial components of any market or industry, demand. See, back in 1999, this demand was latent. Indian people might have enjoyed the convenience of buying things online, but most of them didn't have or couldn't justify paying for access to the internet. And so all of the early e-commerce players in India that tried to emulate the popularity that e-commerce was seeing in the United States failed. There just wasn't enough demand. In 1999, more than 35% of Americans were using the internet, compared to 0.27% of Indians. So it's no surprise that Fabmart went out of business. By 2003 though, Bengaluru's startup ecosystem was beginning to take its first baby steps. Entrepreneurs were seeing an opportunity in India's increasing spending power and deepening internet penetration. For example, in 2003 you had NGPay, a very early mobile commerce startup that would later be acquired by Flipkart. You also had Tonbo Imaging, one of India's first defense startups. Then in 2004, Diraj Sirajaram founded his hybrid data analytics firm Mu Sigma, which would end up becoming one of India's first ever startup unicorns. The next year, in 2005, food product startup ID Fresh Food was founded by PC Mustafa and four of his cousins. And then later that year in September, edtech startup Tutor Vista was founded to bring Indian tutoring online and they would later be acquired by Baijus. Now, like I said earlier, these were baby steps. Each of the startups that I've just mentioned were trailblazers, both within the markets that they were disrupting, but also in a more general sense, because the startup ecosystem that many of us know and love today, this community of startup founders and investors, just didn't exist back then. Remember, this was before Flipkart, before Baijus and Paytm before Ola and Nika and all of the other household name startups that we're familiar with today. None of that existed in 2005. And a big part of the reason why was the lack of venture capital. There's a big hole in venture money for startups in the way we recognize them here in the US, early stage, pre-product or pre-revenue companies. And a majority of the private equity is going into late stage businesses. This 2005 interview with Santa Monica based entrepreneur and VC Sumant Mando sums up the situation in India at the time pretty well. Venture capital is fundamental to the growth of any startup ecosystem. And there wasn't a lot of it in India back in 2005. That would change though in the second half of the decade. Search engine startup Guruji.com was founded in 2006 and quickly made headlines as an Indian alternative to Google. 
Later in the year, Sequoia Capital invested $7 million, making Guruji's Series A round their first investment into a Bengaluru-based company. Also in 2006, Jirate Ventures, the growth stage technology venture capital arm of Beijing-based IDG Ventures, set up shop in Bengaluru. And then towards the end of the year in December, Lightspeed Venture Partners made their first Bengaluru investment into Tudor Vista's Series B round. Outside of the venture capital space though, there was plenty going on in Bengaluru back in 2006. Noteworthy startups that were founded that year, besides Guruji, include Hungry Bangalore, whose founder Sandeepan Mitra would go on to found food tech startup Hungerbox. He also had Printo and Barbecue Nation. Things were finally starting to happen. Startups slowly but surely were beginning to appear, but these were still baby steps. It wasn't until 2007 that Bengaluru's startup ecosystem began to run. Flipkart, Mintra, Emkoj, which would later pivot into Emobi, Verse Innovation, Daily Hunt, Common Floor, Redbus, all founded in 2007 in Bengaluru. This wasn't a rising tide anymore, this was a wave. And it was swelling at precisely the right moment because once again, the United States was going through a crisis. By March of 2008, the United States had officially entered into what would later be known as the Great Recession. And America's real GDP wouldn't return to pre-crisis levels until the third quarter of 2011. And not surprisingly, this had a major impact on venture capital in the United States. Nobody knew how long the crisis was gonna last or what kind of impact it would have on Silicon Valley. And so American VC firms started looking outside of their own country to diversify their portfolios. And what they saw when they looked at India was a startup ecosystem that at one point had been taking baby steps, but now was in an all out sprint. 2008 saw the likes of Quicker, The Better India, Your Story, Prakto, Ada, and Baiju's being founded in Bengaluru. And for the first time ever, Indian startups raised more than a billion dollars nationwide in a single year. Bengaluru had officially become the Silicon Valley of India. 